right, well, welcome back to Gasping for Prayer. This is a sermon series. Uh, we're in the second week, and what I want to do is, if you weren't here last week, I'm just going to recap a little bit so you will all be on the same page. Uh, there were three things that I tried to impress to you last week, uh, and they were this. Number one, everyone can pray. Everyone has a God-given ability to pray. Uh, I use the word inalienable. We don't use that word a lot. Um, it's in our, our founding documents. But it means nobody can take this away from you. This is something that God gave you that no one can take away, that even uh, a sinner has the ability to pray. We, we talked about the sinner on the cross that said, Lord, remember me. Because everyone has this God-given ability to appeal to the creator of the universe. Um, the prayer of a poor person reaches heaven just as fast as the prayer of a billionaire. God makes no distinction there. And he's given everyone this ability. And so, uh, secondly, the second thing I tried to impress upon you last week is that prayer is a gift. Um, it's not a burden. And a lot of times people view praying for the unsaved or situations as a burden. And I mentioned to you that Paul talks about this a spiritual wrestling match that we engage in. And I can feel this, you know, in my life. He says, we don't wrestle with uh, flesh and blood, but against spiritual things, right? You feel that? I know I do. I feel it all the time. There's a tug and a wrestling match. But I, I tried to impress upon the people here last week, and I'm telling you here today, that in this spiritual wrestling match, God has given us a nuclear weapon, okay? In a hand-to-hand -to -hand combat, God has given us a nuclear weapon. Psalm 68 says, let God arise, right? And his enemies be splatter, scattered, okay? Um, that's what we have in this warfare, Okay, and so we can send up a prayer uh, in situations that we're, you know, not able to do anything or we're far removed from it. We can pray for the church uh, around the world from right where we're at. And I try to impress upon everyone here that if you are trying to help someone out in their walk, if you are a prayer warrior and you've been doing this for a while, I made everyone write down this. Anyone can pray at any time at any place, for anything. God has given you that gift, and it's an unbelievable gift. And the third thing I tried to impress last week is to take time to pray. And don't look at the amount of time that you're praying because uh, that will cause you to compare yourself with others. And that, will, that, that is assuredly what we're not supposed to do. Galatians 6.4, each person should examine their own actions. Okay? So, uh, I also talked about, you know, Jesus said you don't, your prayers don't necessarily have to be long-winded. God is not moved by our voluminous loquaciousness. Does anyone need a translation? God don't need a lot of big words, okay? He understands help, okay? And so God's not necessarily impressed by our big words. You know who's impressed by our big words? Each other. We impress each other. And uh, I can tell you this, sometimes when... I'm not the best prayer in, by human standards. I hear some people and I go, wow. That, and they're not trying to impress me. They're just praying. And, and I, I'm like, wow, I'm so far from that. But God didn't intend for us to judge ourselves with how you pray and the words you use and the words you know and the time that you set aside to pray. God didn't intend for us to judge. Uh, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 6 last week, we, we talked about when Jesus was speaking at this sermon on the mount there on the hillside, he told the followers there that day, the, his listeners, he said, get alone with God. When you go, go into the closet, close the door behind you and pray. Now, fast forward to today, we use the term prayer closet, right? We say, oh, you know, but that would have been weird for them because the closet was just a closet. It was, you know, it's where they stored stuff. And so... Uh, one reason why I believe Jesus instructed followers to go into a prayer closet and pray is that you won't be under pressure to impress anyone. You won't. You also won't be under any pressure that you might accidentally embarrass yourself or say the wrong term or say, uh, you know, something inadvertently over and over again or even become tongue-tied. 
all of those things I've done from this platform praying. So it's okay. We also talked about the fact that God understands what you can't describe. Romans 8, 26, the Holy Spirit understands wordless groanings that no one else can understand. And another thing that we really tried to impress upon last week is that prayer is an opportunity to affect the outcome of something that you have no control over. Okay? Prayer is an opportunity to affect the outcome of something you have no control over. And so we need to change our perspective from I have to pray to I get to pray. I have an opportunity. I have a God-given right. I have a gift and and a, a privilege to pray, and I will take time to pray because of that. And so this week in week two of low expectations, or, or I'm sorry, uh, of, of gasping for prayer, the, the subtitle to this particular message is low expectations. There is a USA Today article that I looked at, and it said, by January 17th, most people give up on their New Year's resolutions. So here we are. We're past that day, right? If you've not given up on your resolutions yet, congratulations, okay? And if you haven't started, you've already moved past the date where most people quit. So now's a good time to start making a resolution. Now, if you know me for any amount of time, because I've been here 12 years, you'll know that I'm a strong proponent when I was in youth. I'm a strong proponent of making New Year's resolutions, okay? Not that there's anything magical about January 1st, but that We don't make a lot of resolutions as Americans to do anything, and we especially don't write them down. Write that down. Okay. It's in my brain. I got it. It's locked in. Here's the thing. I'd rather fail at something I wrote down than not even attempt anything all year. So write it down and fail. That's okay. At least you wrote it down and tried. So uh, when, today, the, the topic of the message with low expectations, we're going to kind of talk about why we pray the way we pray. And we're going to discuss some possible reasons. If you have your bulletins, you can take notes and follow along. We're going to discuss some possible reasons why we pray with such low expectations. And uh, just so you know, some of the things that I'm sharing this morning, I spoke from this platform eight years ago. And so for some of you, if you're new here, this is new info. And for others, it may also be new info because you weren't listening eight years ago. So either way, welcome and thanks for paying attention this time. But um, here's some possible reasons why we may pray with low expectations and have an anemic prayer life. The first one is, is more of an attitude than a reason, but why even pray, right? I think that that's a valid question, especially for, uh, you know, someone who's new in the faith. They go, why pray? Uh, But it is a low expectation thought. You know, people say, well, God already knows what I need before I pray, so why pray, okay? Let me give you four reasons real fast that you can jot down in your notes. The first one is Jesus prayed, okay, Um, Look at all these verses, which I know you won't be able to write them all down, but these are just some of the examples of Jesus taking time to pray. And we ought to follow Jesus in word and deed. Amen? So answer this. Actually, don't answer it. It's a rhetorical question. But if Jesus prayed, tell me why you don't need to. Okay? Secondly, Jesus told us to pray. So not only did Jesus lead by example, he also told us to pray. In the uh, Sermon on the Mount, he said that we should pray for our enemies. Uh, Elsewhere, later on in the Gospels, he uh, said we should pray for laborers, you know, people to help uh, spread the gospel and and raise up disciples. Uh, In Luke 18.1, he said we, we should always pray and not lose heart. He told us to pray. That's a good enough reason right there, amen? The Savior of our soul, who is our Lord, told us to pray. And uh, thirdly, Jesus told us how to pray. So he didn't just say, hey, do this. He also gave us, uh, you know, a formula in Matthew chapter 6, you know, that like the Lord's Prayer, he, our Father who art in heaven. It was kind of a formula what, how we uh, should pray. 
And you can pray that way or you can use the formula as a, as a, a stepping stone for your own prayers. And lastly, Jesus told us that our prayers really do accomplish things. They really do. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, Jesus says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open for you. Now, just so you know, in the original language that this is written in, the, the, the word there is, is not just ask, and it, and it will be given. It, it's keep asking. Keep seeking. Keep knocking. It isn't a one and done. Like, I prayed for that two years ago. It didn't happen, so... I'm not praying for that. No, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, and it will be given to you. There's a British evangelist named J. John. He's an amazing, spirit-filled man. And every time I've seen him speak, uh, you know, in, in different teachings that he's given, he always says this, because he's a person of prayer. He says this, when you pray, coincidences happen, and when you don't pray, they don't happen. He just wants you to know, pray and see what happens. Start praying for stuff. Okay, the second reason why we may pray with very low expectations or have an anemic prayer life is that we don't expect God to do anything bigger. So you know how you feel when people put low expectations on you. Now, I know for my children, they like low expectations put on them, right? They don't want any expectations that, that, that they ought to do chores or clean anything. They don't want any expectations at all, right? But you know that as we get older and we join in the, you know, the workforce, we don't like to be treated with condescension that we're incapable or incompetent. Nobody likes that. But that's kind of what we do when we pray these half-hearted prayers to God. Here's how you can tell if you have low expectations. When you read God's word and you say, hey, this is how things used to be. Or when you read God's word and say, this is how things ought to be. Or this is how things, if we pray, could be. Amen? Amen? Yeah. All right. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same Jesus that did all these things back then is still available to us to pray to. And I thank God for all the followers of Jesus throughout history who did not throw in the towel and get discouraged and stop praying for a world that's going to hell, but they prayed. And, and I am a product of whoever in this chain of command of people lasting from generation to generation to generation that shared the gospel with me because people did not get discouraged and give up. Are you thankful for that? Amen. Number three, we think our righteousness doesn't deserve anything. And let me, I may not have phrased that as best as I could. So let me just unpack this and hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense. But we know if you've ever read the Gospels, the book of James is just a couple of chapters. But this verse, uh, a lot of times people memorize it, but verse 516 is the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. We know this verse, right? But I want you to notice something. This is James 5, 16, okay, the latter part of 16. But listen to the next couple of verses that, that James shares to the church here, okay? So he's talking about a powerful prayer by a righteous person. And he says, Elijah, who the, everyone knew, if you've read Eli, you know, the, the Old Testament, Elijah was a powerful person and very righteous. But he had to remind the church, hey, Elijah was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. James had to remind the church that Elijah was a normal human, human being like they were. He was susceptible to all the things that were susceptible to. In fact, if you read 1 Kings 19, Elijah ran away. He got scared. And during this time where he was on the run, he he got so depressed and stressed enough that he wanted to die. Read 1 Kings chapter 19. But here's what I'm trying to convey in this point. Our righteousness doesn't come from the things that we do. It comes from Jesus Christ. Okay? Not from us. Romans 3.22. We are made right with God 
by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who they are, okay? So when I pray, I don't appeal to my righteousness. I'm appealing to God's righteousness. When I pray, I'm appealing to God's goodness because I'm not always that good. Okay. When I pray, I'm not operating in my power. I'm asking to asking God and His power. Okay. And so, what I'm trying to convey in this point is, I think that the devil attacks us in this area because we all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. And when we do, and we ask for forgiveness, and we make a true heart of repentance and try to change, right? God forgave us. And we're made righteous, but we often dwell on that and we don't pray. So, oh, you know, I don't, I'm not a righteous person. I, my prayers are ineffective and weak because I'm not righteous. But your righteousness comes through Jesus Christ, not anything you've done. Isaiah says our righteousness doesn't amount to anything. That's why, uh, you know, sometimes I even have a thought when I'm going to pray for something. A thought says, you, you can't pray for that. That's petty. Aren't there more important things in this world, you know, going on than that need? Well, I know this. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. So if I felt that way, if that thought comes up on my head, and that's maybe a thought from the enemy just trying to prevent me from praying from something in my life, pray for both things. If something comes up and says, hey, what about the church over here that's struggling? I can pray right now for them too. Lord, I pray for the church in China that you would raise them up during this flu epidemic and that they would be a f- powerful force in the name of Jesus, that you would do a mighty work. And I also pray for my situations. And they're both important to you. If some thought that you have, any thought, comes into your mind that discourages you from praying, I want you to strongly consider that that might be from the devil. Any thought that says, no, should you really be praying? Right? Hopefully I've articulated that well enough that, that you get that. Number four is we have faith but we're not always faithful. See, there's a slight difference between, between uh, being full of faith and being faithful. And hopefully I can, you know, explain that too. But you can be full of faith, but if you're not faithful to pray consistently, then you can look forward to a, a prayer life filled with low expectations. Um, sometimes, like as a pastor over the past 12 years, I see people um, that come every blue moon. Right? They'll show up and they're excited. You know, they, 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 they're not very consistent, but they show up and they do love God, but they're very uh, unfaithful in daily, consistently living out that faith. And so they show up every blue moon and they're excited. They let me know all kinds of things. They tell me about songs that we need to do, even though they weren't here for seven weeks, to know that we did them or didn't do them. Right? But I've seen that. These are people that are full of faith. They're excited. But they're not very faithful. And there's a difference. Let me unpack it in one verse. Hebrews eleven six. 6. Okay? Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Okay. Let me show you what I'm talking about in this verse. This is the full of faith part. You have to believe that God exists. You have to believe that. And these people that come that are excited, they do. I don't discredit or discount their faith. They're full of faith, okay, when they show up. But look, this is the faithful part. God rewards those who earnestly seek him consistently, daily, continually, not sporadically or haphazardly or every blue moon, but, it, but makes a choice to be faithful in that. Um, the second part of this verse is equally as important as the first, okay? You need both parts of this equation, okay? In Luke chapter 18, 
Jesus gives a great uh, parable about this persistent widow that, you know, she, she had obviously been wronged. He doesn't say how she was wronged, but something happened to her legally or criminally that she kept going before this judge. And the way that Jesus describes it, the word, uh, this judge was corrupt. He probably took bribes and, and didn't apply justice fairly. He was a very unjust judge. And so this woman kept trying to put her case before him, and he kept dismissing her. No, you have no standing, or this, this isn't my concern. Whatever he said, he kept dismissing her, and she kept going. She kept putting her case before him. And eventually, she wore him out. And even though he was unjust, he said, give her what she wants. I'm tired of looking at her and listening to her. And Jesus said, he, he didn't want you to say, to, to have this thought that God is unjust. But God, who is just, he says in verse 7, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? God is way above an unjust judge. God is the righteous judge of the universe, okay? And if this woman who is persistent can get an unjust judge to get, give her what she wants, how much more God's children who cry out to him day and night? Don't put God in a box and don't give up when your prayers aren't answered to your satisfaction, okay? So you have to be full of faith and faithful, and I believe that if you're consistently faithful, day in, day out, that that will help you to be more and more full of faith. The two go together. And, and hopefully, if you were here last week, hopefully after last week's message, you're not worried about how long you pray, okay? Because I wasn't trying to get you to pray less, but I was trying to get you to pray more consistently. That's the key. Prayer isn't an equation. It's not a mathematical formula, you know, that where I do, 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 right? Long prayer equals answered prayer. None of those things are true. Prayer is part of your relationship with God. God speaks to us through his word, which you should try to read a chapter a day if you can, a verse if you can, something, but do it every day. We eat every day, don't we? Don't act like you don't. Okay. <laughs> Um, but, but we need that every day. And the same thing is with prayer because prayer is communication where when we pray, God reminds us of his word. When we pray, we're able to, you know, give a confession of our sin that's gone on. Or we can give an expression of our sorrows and our griefs that we're struggling with. Or we can give a proclamation of thanks or just place our hopes and dreams in God's hands and know that he'll direct our path. So prayer is part of that relationship with God. It's a communication. You know, in a human relationship, like a husband and wife, say, for instance, Michelle and I, right? Um, imagine if when we go out to dinner, after the check comes and we're getting up to leave, I pull out a timer from my, uh, you know, pocket and hit stop and go, wow, 48 minutes. That's some quality time, huh, babe? I bet she wouldn't be impressed with that at all. You want me to try it? I can try it. You want me to try it? I'll try it. She's not going to be impressed with that. Why is that? Because, um, qual okay, qual quality time has nothing to do with the quantity of time, right? You can spend a quantity of time at traffic court. It's not quality time. In fact, they make you turn your cell phone in, so you have to sit there and listen to all these losers on the road uh, explain all their situations. At least I'm saying this second. I, I've never been there personally. Is that what they did? But <laughs> just kidding. I've been there. But it's not quality time, right? That wasn't convincing at all. Some of you must like traffic or <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Hear a lot of uh, interesting stories and poor excuses. Really bad excuses. You had six weeks, man. You had six weeks to stand before the judge, and that's what you came up with? That stinks. Sir, please be quiet in the back. Sorry, I don't have my cell phone, so I'm kind of bored. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, but, oh, I lost. This is why I have notes. I got to stay on my notes. Okay. I remember when Michelle and I first started dating, okay, we weren't keeping track of time. In fact, we lost track of time. We even got in trouble, okay? 
Where were you? Oh, we just, we were lost in love, okay? <laughs> Hear air supply playing. Um, but you don't keep track of time like that with the person you love. You really keep track of the time you're not with them. Like, oh, you know, I, I miss you. I've been, yeah, I want to be with you. So, like I said, quality time isn't an amount of time, but more the amount of time that you're thinking about that person, okay? And so I want to encourage you to be faithful in that. And that's just kind of a follow-up from last week, talking about length of time. So don't, don't get caught up on length of time. Start with the relationship aspect of prayer. In Mark chapter 9, there was a guy whose uh, kid was all messed up. And Jesus looked at him. He brought his kid to Jesus, and Jesus said, do you believe I can heal him? And this man said something so profound. He said, I do believe, but help me with my unbelief. You see, God will give you faith if you're, if you're faithful. Romans 12, 3 says God has allotted each a measure of faith. God will give you faith. You just need to be faithful and consistent. And so I want you to repeat this after me, okay? I may not always be full of faith, I may not always be full of faith. but help me to be faithful. Amen. Lastly this morning is pride. Uh, privately, let me talk about pride in a private prayer life. Um, I've talked to people like this before. Um, they, they, they really, they say, well, I don't need anything. I don't, I'm all set. I get up, I go to work, I'm healthy. Uh, I don't need prayer for anything. Those types of people inadvertently ignorantly and arrogantly don't understand all the blessings that God has given that person to feel so disinterested to pray a prayer of thanks. When things don't work right, all of a sudden you're suddenly aware, right? And this person who is able-bodied can go where he wants, when he wants, you know, has the finances to pay for what he needs. All of these things that are a blessing from God doesn't realize that these are th- that that he's unbelievably blessed. It's it's kind of an arrogance and an ignorance, and so that's private in our private prayer lives. And hopefully, if you have that thought, don't have that. God has blessed you immensely. If you feel like you don't need to pray for anything, think about what a blessing that is. Maybe you should pray pray a prayer of thanks. Thank you, God, that I don't feel like I need anything. My knees work. My back works. My hips are working. My ankles work. I can keep naming body parts where I'll hit some of you and you're like, oh, yes, you better be thankful, buddy. Right? And so that's why we don't privately pray. And publicly, in a public setting like this at church, sometimes we don't pray for others. We're afraid to go up to, we call this the altar where people come and, you know, pray kneel before the Lord. We, we're afraid to go to the altar and pray with someone or pray someone with someone in the aisle because we don't want to look dumb if our prayer doesn't get answered, you know, or if it isn't the answer that we're praying for. Here's how you'll never look dumb. Do not speak on God's behalf. Don't do it. God better have spoke to you in a way that's unshakable, that you absolutely have to say it, but don't haphazardly speak on God's behalf because I have seen someone whose life has been devastated 20 years later from someone who spoke on God's behalf and it was a lie because it did not come true, right? If, if God speaks, it will come true. And this person said, don't worry, this person who's sick will live. God told me that. Do not speak on God's behalf because that person died. And the person I know is still struggling with this 20 years later. So here's how you don't look dumb. Don't speak on God's behalf unless God has really spoke to you. And if he spoke to you about healing, say, God, I'm just going to one-up this. Let me be the person to heal them. I don't want to just tell them they're healed. Anybody can say you're going to get healed. Anybody can say that. So if you don't want to look dumb, please swallow your pride about the lack of terminology you have, the lack of biblical depth that you have or theological understanding. God understands wordless groanings. Pray for someone. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. 
Here's how you, you'll never be ashamed if you put it in God's hands. Say, so God, your word says that you offer healing, so we're asking for that. We put it in your hands, not ours. Lord, we are asking, if it be your will, that healing would come. And that's it. Put it in God's hands and let him be the judge and the decider in that. And so this morning, I want to encourage all of you not to pray with low expectations. To not just be full of faith, if he, uh, the first part of uh, Hebrews 11.6, but be faithful. Those two things are vitally important. And I want to ask you a question this morning. I want you to think about this. Did you ever think that it might be a trap from the enemy to discourage you from praying because the enemy truly knows the power of prayer? Maybe the enemy knows that your prayers are more powerful than you even understand. And so if the enemy can discourage you Uh, that nothing's going to change, then you won't even bother uttering a prayer. And if he can get you to be discouraged to not even utter the prayer, he's already won. Because he doesn't have the power to overcome your prayer. All he can do is try, try to thwart you from praying. Do you hear the difference there? This devil is a, I don't want to say puny, but he, compared to God, The devil has no power to stop God from moving if God wants to move. How many of you believe that? But he certainly seems to have power over us in discouraging us from even spitting out the prayer. Because I've been praying for this person for a decade. Nothing's changed. So I'm not going to pray today. Who won? The devil won because you didn't even speak it. You have Psalm 68 at your arsenal. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. And don't be discouraged by the length of time that those prayers take to get answered. Here's what I know about my own prayer life. I don't pray thunderous prayers. I don't. But I pray to the one who thunders from heaven. I don't pray the most eloquent prayers, but I pray to the one who knows all the languages of the world and understands wordless groanings. I don't pray the most powerful prayers, but I pray to the one who's most powerful. Amen? And my prayers don't move heaven and earth, but I pray to the one who moves the heavens and moves the earth. Amen? Would you stand with me? Let's close in prayer.